In this paper, we introduce a novel method to render images containing subsurface scattering. Subsurface scattering describes the effect of light entering an object in one location, then scattering internally, and then exiting somewhere else. This effect is very common in the real world, as we can see in these examples here. Subsurface scattering is also an important effect to model when rendering both stylized and realistic characters. So if we want to render realistic images, we have to be able to synthesize subsurface scattering effects efficiently. First, let's have a brief look at the physical process behind subsurface scattering. Here we have a schematic view of an object exhibiting subsurface scattering. We usually assume objects with subsurface scattering to be enclosed in a refractive boundary. A photon emitted by the light source can now enter the object, scatter internally, and then eventually exit and reach the camera sensor. Photons may scatter hundreds of times before reaching the camera. The brute force way of rendering subsurface scattering is to use volumetric path tracing. We start by tracing a light path from the camera and then simulate internal scattering events until it eventually hits a light source. We have to sample many of these light paths to obtain a converged image. And constructing each one of these light paths is expensive as we have to simulate up to th hundreds of scattering events inside of the object. If we do not evaluate enough light paths, we get a noisy image, which is of course very undesirable. Overall, using volumetric path tracing becomes quite expensive when rendering subsurface scattering. We can also look at subsurface scattering using the abstraction of the bidirectional scattering surface reflectance distribution function, or short BSSRDF. For two points and incident directions, the BSSRDF quantifies how much radiance incident at one location will exit at the other location on the surface. There's a large amount of previous work on subsurface scattering. Most previous work on subsurface scattering is based on using transport theory, such as for example the diffusion approximation. Diffusion theory allows to derive closed form expressions for the BSSRDF under the assumption of planar geometry. In practice, most objects we would like to render are of course not planar. Extending diffusion theory to general non-planar geometry is extremely difficult or even impossible. This has led to more and more renderers abandoning diffusion models in favor of brute force path tracing. In our work, we introduce a novel learned BSSRDF model, which is shape adaptive. If we compare the results obtained using our method to previous work, such as for example beam dipole diffusion, we can see that having a shape adaptive BSSRDF model allows light to be scattered through the edges of this cube, for example. When using a model which is not shape adaptive, the overall appearance is much more flat. These two images are rendered at equal time. Our model is slightly more expensive to evaluate than, for example, beam dipole diffusion, but at the same time produces a less noisy image. One other important aspect is that in practice, we do not just want to evaluate the BSSRDF. The reason for that is that we would like to use path tracing to render images of objects with subsurface scattering embedded in a 3D scene. When a path from the camera hits an object with subsurface scattering, we would like to efficiently find where it exits the object again, and then continue tracing it in the scene until it eventually hits a light source. Our model allows to efficiently sample the position after internal scattering proportional to the value of the BSSRDF. Now let's define this problem of important sampling the BSSRDF a bit more precisely. For a given incident location on the surface, light can take many different paths to exit the object again. These paths effectively form a distribution of outgoing positions on the surface. Our goal is now to use machine learning to learn how to directly sample the distribution of outgoing locations rather than having to simulate all internal scattering events. The distribution of outgoing locations depends on the incoming position, direction, scene geometry, here symbolized by the small bunny, as well as the parameters of the scattering medium inside of the object. Theta here summarizes all these medium parameters, such as albedo and anisotropy. If we can directly sample the outgoing position, we do not have to run the expensive brute force path tracing. Note that we can still use brute force path tracing to obtain training data, but more on this later. While the distribution of outgoing locations depends on the incident direction, we make the approximation that the directional distribution after exiting the object is uniform. It could be interesting to lift this approximation in future work, but for now, this is a reasonable approximation for many different cases. One other important aspect I haven't mentioned so far is that not all light paths will eventually exit the object. Some light paths might enter the object, but then get absorbed inside. 
So we will also have to model this aspect of subsurface scattering. As I mentioned before, our method is shape adaptive. The distribution of outgoing locations and the probability of absorption both depend on the input geometry. Since subsurface scattering is a localized phenomenon, we are interested in having a shape descriptor which summarizes a local neighborhood around the incident location. We do not need to know about parts of the shape which are far away from the incident location. We found it to work well to represent the surface using a polynomial approximating a sine distance function. If we have some surface here in 2D, we can also represent it as the zero set of a sine distance function. So in this case here, we define the sine distance function to be equal to zero on the surface, larger than zero outside of it, and smaller than zero on the inside. The lines here represent isocontours of such a function. We use a polynomial sine distance function and then use the coefficients of this polynomial as our shape descriptor. This descriptor is compact as it's just a few floating point numbers. Further, it is interpretable as we can always inspect the surface represented by the polynomial. The polynomial is fit per incident location. For a given incident location on the surface, we fit the polynomial to points on the surface around that incident location. Since subsurface scattering is a localized effect, we only care about the polynomial accurately representing the geometry in close vicinity of the incident location. The size of the fitting kernel is determined from the medium parameters. The kernel becomes smaller as the medium gets more dense and larger as the medium becomes thinner. The polynomial is fit such that its values on points on the surface are close to zero and that its gradient roughly matches the surface normal. The constraint on the polynomial's gradient is a regularizer to avoid the trivial solution. This fitting procedure is very similar to the moving least squares method used in geometry processing. One good thing about using a polynomial representation is that we can easily encode the incident ray direction in the polynomial coefficients. For example, given its geometry and given incident direction, we will extract a polynomial defined in a coordinate frame aligned to the incident direction. If we now rotate the incident direction, we'll obtain a different polynomial in the coordinate frame aligned to the new incident direction. This means that we do not have to explicitly pass the incident direction to our model, since it's already encoded in the shape descriptor. Here is a visualization of the local polynomial coefficients on an example surface. We use polynomials of order 3, which means that our shape descriptor consists of 20 floating point numbers, which we visualize separately here. We can see that some polynomial coefficients encode, for example, this edge on the bottom of the ways. Other coefficients are used to represent knobs or even thin regions such as these handles. Given the polynomial features, we can also ask how faithfully they represent the original surface. In this illustration, we fit two local polynomials to the geometry around the blue and red locations on the right. We visualize the surfaces corresponding to the sine distance functions represented by these polynomials. We can see that the polynomials accurately capture local features such as the handle of the vase on the left. Here are two other examples of such local fits where the polynomial fits this small knob and the central part of the vase. On the right, we can see that as we go further away from the center of the fitting kernel, the approximation quality decreases. Now let's have a look at our neural network architecture. We have a number of input features, such as effective albedo, medium anisotropy, index of refraction of the surface, as well as a surface descriptor. We pass our input features to a so-called feature network. It consists of three fully connected layers, which pre-process our input features. The pre-processed input features are then fed to a scatter and absorption network. The scatter network uses these features and the Gaussian random vector to sample an outgoing location. The absorption network uses the pre-processed features to compute the probability of absorption. This absorption probability is then used to weight samples at render time. Now let's have a closer look at how the scatter network is trained and how these random numbers are used to generate a point on the surface. Our scatter network is based on a variational autoencoder, which we train to sample from the ground truth distribution of outgoing surface locations. A variational autoencoder is essentially a twist on the idea of a conventional autoencoder. Autoencoders are neural networks which take some high dimensional input, encode it into a typically lower dimensional latent space, and then decode it again. The encoder and decoder are neural networks which are trained to minimize the reconstruction loss between input and output. In a variational autoencoder, the deterministic encoder is now replaced by a probabilistic encoder. This encoder now maps an input not just to one point in latent space, but rather to a distribution in latent space. 
The variational autoencoder is then trained with an additional KL divergence loss, which makes sure that the latent state-based distribution is close to the standard normal distribution. After training, we can then discard the encoder. We can then generate new samples in latent space by sampling from a standard normal distribution. By applying the decoder to newly generated samples in latent space, we can get new samples in the original space, which closely follow the data distribution observed during training. A variational autoencoder is one way in which we can learn how to sample from a general distribution. In our case, the scatter network is simply the decoder of a variational autoencoder. The variational autoencoder is conditioned on the pre-processed input features. This whole network is trained on ground truth data produced using volumetric path tracing on polynomial surfaces. We actually trace multiple paths per surface, and each path which is not absorbed is in one training example. We then also compute the absorption as the ratio of all the light paths we trace and the number of absorbed light paths. The ground truth absorption is used to train the network to predict the correct absorption values. The polynomial surfaces we use to generate our training data are actually obtained by fitting polynomials to a dataset of meshes. The mesh dataset consists of randomly scaled and rotated geometry. We then fit polynomials at random surface locations. Here we visualize points generated by our scatter network after training. As you can see, they align fairly well with the surface, but some points are not lying exactly on the surface. The network is not constrained to produce points which lie exactly on the surface. Therefore, to use this model for rendering, we project the sampled points back onto the surface. Since the points already align quite well with the surface, the projection step is straightforward. We project the sampled points along the direction of the gradient of the polynomial shape approximation. Here is a rendering obtained using our method on a scene with a range of different geometries. We compare the result of our method to volumetric path tracing and two different diffusion-based BSSRDF approximations. All images are rendered at equal time using the Mitsuba renderer. Overall, our method achieves the lowest numerical errors. In these error maps, we visualize relative mean square error. If we look closely at the result, we can see that our shape adaptive method more closely matches the appearance of unbiased path tracing than beam dipole diffusion. Since beam dipole diffusion is not shape adaptive, detail is lost on the edges of objects. The forward scattering dipole model is more accurate, but suffers from excessive noise due to its important sampling routine not being very robust. It's also interesting to look at how these models perform when trying to render media which are less dense. This is not a case where one would typically want to use a subsurface scattering model, but it can be useful to see how different models degrade. As you can see here, our model holds up quite well, whereas diffusion-based models generally break down if the scattering medium becomes too thin. In this case, the forward scattering dipole actually seems to introduce excess energy on some of the objects. This last example also highlights one of the main problems with dipole models. It is very difficult to correctly import and sample the derived BSSRDF on arbitrary 3D geometry. Dipole-based methods result in a two-dimensional BSSRDF kernel, and when important sampling this kernel, we have to map samples generated according to this 2D kernel to the 3D geometry. To correctly normalize the sampling procedure, one would have to compute the total surface area inside of a small sphere. This area is unbounded, so normalizing the sampling procedures correctly is very difficult. On this example here, we show two different implementations of a dipole model compared to our result. Depending on how we normalize the dipole model, we either end up with excessive energy gains or losses. These are particularly visible in regions with complex geometry, such as the eyelids or ears. Our method does not have any of these issues, as it does not require manual normalization. Here are some more results on some backlit geometry. In this scene, the geometry becomes thinner towards the right. The camera is facing down and the light is arranged in a checkerboard pattern behind the object. We can see that our method more faithfully reproduces the appearance of the reference image than previous subsurface scattering approximations. In conclusion, our method replaces an expensive Monte Carlo evaluation by a neural network. This is done without having to replace the entire renderer. Our subsurface scattering model is shape adaptive and has important sampling built in. For future work, it would be interesting to investigate using learned shape descriptors, for example based on point clouds. In practice, there are many shapes where a polynomial approximation of the surface is not enough to get a perfect reproduction of the ground truth subsurface scattering. Since our method is centered around sampling, it does not offer an efficient way to evaluate the BSSRDF value or the PDF of sampling. Adding this to the model will be useful, for example when using the model alongside bidirectional light transport algorithms. Last but not least, one could potentially also improve performance by using batching or even GPU rendering. This concludes this presentation, so thank you for your attention.